The text that serves as the basis of the message this evening comes from the Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 28th verse. Hear the word of the Lord. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone of the truth What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to imagine for a moment in, in rural Wisconsin, a pastor is, is asked to come and offer uh, the commendation of the dying, which is a, a service of word and prayer uh, for an elderly member of his congregation that was nearing the end of his life. The pastor shares God's word, bringing comfort and peace to the family who had gathered there together at the bedside in order to share stories and, and to comfort one another and to await their loved one's call home from the Lord. See the kingdom. Or in a small congregation in Kansas, a young mother steps through the front door of the church seeking some assistance from the church to pay a, a long, unpaid electrical bill. And a member of the congregation uh, who had volunteered to serve that day sits with her and listens to her story and prays with her and then contacts the power company to pay her bill. See the kingdom. Early one Sunday morning, a, a homeless man is found sleeping right outside the church doors of a, of a church in Georgia. One of the deacons from the church finds the man sleeping there and provides him worship. See the kingdom. And then, on a Sunday morning, you approach the altar. And you're you there, his true body and his true blood, taking all your sins away, strengthening your faith, and building you up in his image. See the kingdom. You know, so often we know the kingdom of God when we see it, but we often have difficulty when it comes to defining it. And that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. We're going to talk about the kingdom of God. In our text, Pilate struggles with the understanding of the concept of what the kingdom of God is. And you know what? Truth be told, I think we all struggle with that every now and then. You know, the sermon series we've been running with here during the season of Lent uh, is called Return to the Lord, and we've been focusing on God's call to each and every one of us to return to Him. And we first heard that call in the Old Testament prophetic book of Joel when Joel wrote, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger 
and abounding in steadfast love. And so as we've gone through this journey in Lent, we've reflected on our own sinfulness, but we've also heard how God continues to pursue us, how he continues to seek us out, how he continues to encourage us to repent and, and calls us to return to him again and again. And today, God calls us to return to his kingdom. And so let's consider exactly what the kingdom of God entails. Now, in order to return to the kingdom of God, we must know what the kingdom of God is and where it is, right? Oftentimes, we hear that phrase, kingdom of God, and, and we think of some earthly destination, right? We think of some geographic location where you can find borders to where God's kingdom is. And so we conclude oftentimes that the kingdom of God is confined to a place. And one such place might be the church, right, for instance. So we think, well, the kingdom of God is, is here in church. It's marked by the walls here that serve as the border for where it is. Now, certainly the kingdom of God is here in church. There's no doubt about that, but it's not limited to just this place. Now, perhaps the kingdom of God follows a pastor around, right? Sort of a, a mobile kingdom that's centered on the things that God does through his humble servants. But still, if you think about it, that doesn't seem right either because that downplays what Scripture clearly states, which is that all of us are members of the body of Christ, pastors and non-pastors alike. Right? We all have roles to play within this kingdom. And besides, pastors and church workers aren't any holier than anybody else, too. <laughs> Believe it or not, right? They're also sinners. We are sinners. We're in need of grace, just like everybody else. And uh, our work is no more or less important, really, than anybody else's. So the kingdom can't only be centered on a pastor either. Now, what if the kingdom of God is purely a heavenly reality? Okay, maybe it's all about that day that the Lord calls us home and we're in his presence forever. and We get to see him face to face. And after he's called us out of uh, this veil of tears into, into glory in heaven. But you know what? That can't be right either because that minimizes our physical life. Right? God didn't make a mistake when he made us both with a body and a soul. Right? What's more, Jesus purposely entered into this physical world, didn't he? He was born a human just like us. He died for our sins. He rose again, all of that, in his physical body. In fact, Jesus has that body right now. And you can see the marks of his love the marks of the nails in his hands and his feet, even today. And he did all of that right here on earth. You can go visit the place he was born. You can go visit the place he grew up. You can go and visit the place where he died. And one day he's promised to come again and to restore this creation, to restore our bodies, to establish his earthly reign. And so it's quite evident that the kingdom of God is not only a spiritual reality, but it's also a physical one as well. So then, where is the kingdom of God? That is what Pilate struggled with when he was speaking to Jesus. See, the chief priests had turned Jesus over to Pontius Pilate on Friday morning, and their intentions were very clear. They said, this man must die. Now, Pilate tries to de-escalate the whole situation, but he gets backed into a corner, and so he brought Jesus in to talk with him to get to the bottom of what was really going on here. And so Pilate asked Jesus, he says, are you the king of the Jews? Now, this was no real idle question from Pilate. Pilate clearly understood what the chief priests had been up to, and he really had a good idea of why Jesus was turned over to him. Now, Jesus, though, couldn't answer this question with a simple yes. 
And the reason he couldn't do it is he couldn't do that if he really wanted Pilate to understand what all that meant. Pilate had this particular assumption of what the word king meant. And so Pilate's idea of Jesus' kingship wouldn't fit into his preconceived understanding. Jesus could certainly tell him that, yes, I, I am a king, but Pilate would have certainly jumped to the wrong conclusion of what that meant. Pilate might think that Jesus was maybe vying for political power, or he might think that Jesus was a threat to the Roman Empire. Uh, but that's not what Jesus was doing, right? Jesus is king. There's no doubt about that, but he's an entirely different kind of king uh, on a more specific and significant level than what Pi Pilate could even understand. And so Jesus responds to Pilate's question, are you the king of the Jews, by saying, did you say this of your own accord, or did others say it about me? Well, Pilate wasn't any, in any mood to debate with Jesus, so he said in so many words, he said, listen, I'm not a Jew, and frankly, I, I don't even care who the king of the Jews might be, but you've obviously rubbed somebody the wrong way, and they've turned you over to me. Help me understand what's going on. So Jesus did his best to explain to Pilate. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, it's not a kingdom like you would imagine. And Jesus said, if it were that kind of kingdom, my servants would be using force in order to try and save me. But they're not. And that's because that's not the kind of kingdom I have. It's something else. It's something bigger. It's something much more significant. Now, Pilate thinks about that for a moment, and he says, so you are a king. And Jesus' answer to him is so profound. Jesus said, you say that I am. And what he means is, yes, you've spoken the truth, or now you're starting to get it. Now you're starting to understand. But Jesus goes on to explain to him that He's the kind of king that comes into this world to point people to something far more important than they could ever imagine. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. And he said, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Well, it's at this point Pilate just gives up, right? It's because he's un unable to understand this kind of a kingdom that Jesus is explaining. To him, a kingdom is still a place, right? It's a geographic location for Pilate that's really defined by how far Rome's power can reach, right? So at the top of Pilate's kingdom, of course, is Caesar. And then under Caesar are other rulers, like Pilate himself, and then those under him, and then everybody else. So Pilate can't conceive of a kingdom where membership is defined by people listening to the voice of Jesus. Now, when I started the sermon here tonight, I, I went over like four scenarios where we can see the kingdom of God. And I want you to know there are countless more scenarios or scenes where we can see the kingdom of God. We Christians understand that the kingdom of God is, is not about some ge uh, geographical boundary. And it's also not about any particular group of people either. Instead, the kingdom of God is defined by the king, Jesus, and by those who listen to him. In fact, the word for kingdom in the Bible is, is not primarily a noun-based word like, let's say, a proper noun that we might use for an earthly kingdom, like Rome. Uh, no, the, the, king, the word kingdom in the Bible is basically a verb-based noun, um, as in the active reign and rule of God. See, that is what the kingdom of God is. It's not a location, it's an action. 
It's the active reign and rule of God. It's all about God's activity. So the kingdom of God can be found wherever our loving God is inviting and forgiving and encouraging and building people up. The kingdom of God is wherever Jesus can be found. The kingdom of God is wherever the work of the Holy Spirit is present. It's wherever God is at work. The kingdom of God is not of this world, Jesus told Pilate, but it's most certainly in this world. So it's not of the world, but it's in the world. Jesus was in the world, and he's the one we look to first and foremost in order to see the kingdom. Jesus came to save. He died, he rose again, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's going to come again to judge the living and the dead. Wherever Jesus is present, whether that's him teaching crowds, or whether that's him standing before Pilate, or whether that's him hanging on a cross, there is the kingdom of God. But you know what? That's not all. The kingdom of God can also be found in the places where Jesus has promised to be present today. See, Jesus hasn't left us alone, right? And he gives us specific locations that are very concrete as to where he can be found. He's promised to be found in his word and in his sacraments. We hear his voice in his word. Maybe it's preached by your pastor. Maybe it's the word that you read with your family for devotion. We receive his body and blood in the Lord's Supper. We're made members of his kingdom through the power of the Holy Spirit in baptism. Jesus truly is present in and among us. And he's present in those places where he's chosen to work with his gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. And God continues to be at work in these merciful and gracious ways so that is where you can find the kingdom. And finally, we can find the kingdom of God in places where Jesus uses his very own people to be his hands and to be his feet. So God's kingdom can be found in places like your home, right? Where God's word is read out loud, where God's word is shared among your family members. The kingdom of God can be found even in your friendships, where you pray with your friends and for your friends. It can be found in our neighborhoods, where you help someone without any expectation of uh, them returning any favor whatsoever. It can be found in our communities, too, when the neediest and the poorest are, are served uh, in the name of Jesus. And the kingdom of God can be found in congregations all over the world where we seek to honor God and to love our neighbor. Now, God calls you to be part of his reign and his rule right here, right now. He calls you to be active in his kingdom, to witness the work that he's doing here in our midst, and to participate in that work, too. He calls you to play a role as his hands and, has, and as his feet, to share his love with others, people both inside this church and outside this church. That's the kingdom of God um, that, that God has called you into and that you are a part of. That's the kingdom that God has called you to participate in. And because of it, you can rejoice. You can rejoice because you know that you serve not some king or kingdom that's here today and gone tomorrow. You serve the one who created you, the one who redeemed you, the one who sanctifies you. He's the one who bears witness to the truth, the truth that he loves you, the truth that he died for you and rose again, the truth that he's coming again to take you to the place that he's prepared for you, the truth that he reigns as your king, here and forever. Amen.